Great. Um, first, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, today's SCA Day of Learning is dedicated in honor of our community's selfless medical professionals. May our learning merit the refuah shalema of our dear founder, Stanley Chira, Shalomo ben Shoshana, and all those who have fall, fallen ill. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Now, first, I have to fix it. Hold on one second. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, so when I was thinking about today and what class really to, to give, my thoughts really went to the fact that we are really very much in a situation that is a first for all of us. My mother, God bless her, and may she live to be 120 years old, is 82. And we asked her if she ever experienced anything like this, and she said no. And Bezrat Hashem, we won't experience anything like this again. Um, so I thought that, you know, this is a very difficult time for us. And my thoughts turn to um, the Mishnah and Pesachim that says that, um, that we begin the Haggadah, we begin the story of the exodus of Egypt in the following way. So here it is. It says in the Mishnah, ben, and according to the wisdom or the ability of the child, Aviv milamdo, Matchil bignut umisayim b'shevach. That a father will teach his son according to how much he can handle that, and we start the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim with ginut, with some kind of here. The English here calls it a disgrace, and then we end with shevach, and we lead to glory. Um, and then the Mishnah states, "Vidoresh me arami oved avi," and we do this through the story that. Um, of Arami Oved Avi, that's found in Sefer Devarim, chapter 25. It's what Bnei Israel say when we bring the Bikurim offering to the Beit HaMikdash. We go through the whole story uh, from before actually going down to Eretz Mitzrayim, going down to Egypt, and then coming out to Rehush Gadol. And we say that all of this is due to Hashem's graciousness towards us. And Ad Sheigmor Kola Parasha Kula. And then it takes, and we say everything till the end of that. Parasha. And the Gemara comments then a little bit further down on the page. What does it mean? Matchil bignut umistayim b'shevach. There's a little argument here. And both are two very different kinds of ginut. My bignut, Rav Amar mitichila ovde avodat girulim. Hayu avoteno. He says that we have to start with the fact that our forefathers were worshippers of avodazara and Shemuel, Shemuel Amar avadim hayinu that we just start with the fact that we started as slaves. And Amar uh, of Nachman, so then they bring in a little story here to illustrate Shemuel's point, because in, in fact, in the end, we start our answer to the four questions with Abadim Hayinu. Av Nachman says to his servant Daro, Avde, Avde, and his name is Daro, Avda de mafik le mare le cherut, a servant, a slave who comes out of servitude into freedom, the Yahiv Le Kaste, and his master gives him money when he leaves, and, and gold when he leaves. My Ba'elame Marle, what should he tell him? Amarle Ba'el Udzaye U Shabuche. You have to give, he has to give thanks and he has to give praise to the person that freed him. So, you know, it's just a story to show that, you know, it makes sense that when you, when you want to give praise for something, or you want to give thanks for something, or you want to share a thought about something, that you really think about um, the change. Now, here was someone who was in servitude, who was in a bad position, and if they could reflect on their bad position and what that good position is now, then Yatsanu with Manish Tanan, we can already start with the Abadim Hayinu piece. So we're going to come back to right here with Rav Cook, who in his Perush for the Haggadah talks about what is the difference? Why do we start with the Gnut and end with the Shevach? And it's not so much just, just for realization of the fact that we have more. Rav Cook has a little more 
of an intense understanding of what it means to start with the Genut and come back to the Sheva. And he talks about in this beginning part over here, which I'm not going to read through in the entirety in the Hebrew, but I'll just tell you about it. He talks about that there's two different kinds of life. I'll just point to it right here. He says there's Chaye HaChana, and that's the kind of stuff you do, Shebahem HaAchila, Hihechrechit, that, that eating and, and that kind of eating in a way where you're eating to survive. And then there's Chaye HaTachlit. Right? And that's more of when you've come to a higher level of doing things. So when he says that this matchil bignut umisayem b'shevach is someone who starts with saying something that's not so wonderful, which might be chaye hachana, and then he comes to chaye chaye tachlit, and and you can't really have one without the other. We know this, by the way, because many, many times in the Torah itself, it refers to the fact that we were Avadim in Mitzrayim, and that's why we know to do certain things, and that's why we have certain feelings for things. So here, with Chaye, ha ha with chaye Hachana, is the Genut. So what does it mean? What does the Avdut do for us? What did the slavery in Egypt do for us? So he says here that it taught us the quality of submission. It says you can't have complete freedom, Rav Cook says, unless you understand what the concept of submission and serving a greater cause is. To really serve God. That you should be able to, to overcome your own desire and to use some examples from today, our own desire to go out, our own desire even to go to work or to go to school, our own desire to go for a run in the park, to hang out with friends, to get together, to go to a movie, to go to a restaurant. Here he's talking about taking it further. We have to some we have to be able. Hashem had to make us able to come to a point where we're willing to be subservient so that we can be mekabel o machut shamayim. And that Bnei Israel has done very well with, and it will bring a lot of greatness to the world. And that goes back to, in the Gemara, that argument, where do we start? That's the starting with Avadim Hayinu. And we start with Avadim Hayinu because that's one ability of the Jewish people to see that we, where we should be servants, where should we are, where we should be submissive, to whom we should be submissive. And then he says something else. <laughs> oh, and here he says that there's no way to be completely free until biyot adam kol kach bnei chori ad she yuchal becheruto hamuchletet gam ken l'sheabed atzmo b'makom haraui. You can't really be completely free until you allow yourself to be subservient in the right moments and to the right master. And then he talks about that whole concept of starting with Avodat Bilinim, that we start and we tell the story of when our fathers or forefathers were of De Avodah Zarah. And he says here, So we have a tendency to focus on the intellectual, to focus on the spiritual, to commune with Hashem. But had we not originally been of day avodah zarah, then we would not have had the focus on the material, on the creativity, on the ability to innovate in the world. Because sometimes when people focus so much on the spiritual, on the connection of the spiritual world to the physical world, alo yachol hayaliyot mishtamet miadam legamre koach adimyon, we could just simply say, everything is God's hands. So we can't try to figure out a cure for this, or we can't figure out a better way to do this, or we can't develop this technology or that innovation. And we would remove ourselves from the world, which very many spiritual um, movements have done. But that's not the purpose of B'nai Israel in the world. <laughs> The, the Jewish people and what God wants from us is to build something beautiful in the world that is going to help other people and to be a partner in the creation of the world. 
And when we say partner in creation of the world, we obviously don't mean creating the world itself, but creating a world that works in conjunction with the resources that God gave us. And this part comes from that original focus on the material and from that original worship of the material, right? So now, now that Hashem brought us close to him after years and years of worshiping the material, we can combine that worship of God we can do it with that background of where we came from. And that gives us a tremendous amount of strength that we will then use So it's that original difficulty that always brings us through to learning about ourselves, to perfecting our world, and even in perfecting what we, what, what we experience when we worship Hashem. So I wanted to just talk about this a little bit more because if you notice in the Haggadah itself, there's a difference between what comes after Avadim Hayinu and what comes after Mitzichila Udeh Abu Dazara Hayu Abutenu. After Avadim Hayinu is a whole discussion of different stories of different rabbis and how they told the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim and for how long they told the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim and the four sons and all of those things. There isn't there isn't that much of the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. The story of Yitziat Mitzrayim comes after the Metichila of De Avodazara, and it immediately goes into it, exactly like the Mishnah says that. Um, you, you should be Doresh the parasha, and it's a short parasha that we say of Arami Oved Avi. And for the rest of my kids, the whole story of Yitziat Mitzrayim comes from this Arami Oved Avi. This, these few psukim that we say, and they're not more, they're like six psukim here, that we say that is a tribute to what we bring with us when we come for Chag HaBikurim on Shavuot, which is really technically the end of Chag HaPesach, right? So it comes here and it says, Arami Oved Avi, and the Haggadah and most traditional Mifarshim explain it as Arami Oved Avi is Lavan, right? And then Vayere Mitzrayma, Vayagar Sham B'mitem Me'at, and we, we, he went down to Egypt and he lived there and he was very small and he became a great nation and it continues and continues with the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. So if if I can with you. Um, so Rashi defines this as Arami Oved Avi, Maskir Makom. It reminds us of the graciousness of Hashem. Lavan Bikesh La Koret Hakol Kisheradaf Achar Yaakov. When when Yaakov had made the decision to go back to Eretz Israel, Lavan was chasing him. So even though Lavan didn't do anything, right? Because it says Arami Oved Avi. But he didn't do anything to Yaakov in the end. But because he thought to do it, Hashem reports it, and we report it as if he did it. That, that, we, that many times Hashem, especially with Umot HaAlam, says that a machshava is like a maaseh. But there is another mifarish, and I'd like to um, bring this up in memory of my father, Moshe ben Salcha, because he used to like to say this every year, that. Uh, Arami Oved Avi says Ibn Ezra can't mean Lavan. It has to mean Yaakov Avinu. Um, and my father said, and we're going to show it to you, uh, we'll see it inside, and what the Ibn Ezra said, that just by the grammar, it has to be Arami Oved Avi. And then the question here is, what is it about Yaakov then that the Torah calls him Arami Oved Avi and the Torah wants to remind us about when we're given Bikurim? So we're going to read it inside. Oved Avi, Arami Oved Avi, Milat Oved Mehape Alim, Shenam Yotzim, the Ilu Haya Arami Alavan, Haya Katuv Omer, Maavid Om Abed. So Ibn Ezra says the grammar is off. You got to know grammar if you want to learn Torah. So what's the deal here? If it wanted to talk about Lavan, it would say 
Arami me'abed avi. He's doing something to my father. It's not a description. Oved avi is like it's it's the person himself who's doing it. So the grammar here is off. The odd, and he says, Mataam lomar lavan bikesh ha'avid avi vayered mitzrayma. So how do they connect? He's building his question, the Ibn Ezra here, right? Arami oved avi vayered mitzrayma doesn't work. Lavan didn't chase. Yaakov into Egypt. Lavan, ch Lavan chased Yaakov into Eretz Israel. Yaakov goes down to Egypt by himself. So what's the connection there between Arami Oved Avi Vayered Mitzrayma? There isn't. The Lavan Mosidev Laredet El Mitzrayim. It doesn't bring him down to Egypt. Yaakov, and what makes more sense to me, says the Ibn Ezra, is Sharami Hu Yaakov. That really, who is the Arami? The Arami himself is Yaakov. And Oved means that Yaakov was lost. And what does it mean that he was lost? Ki'ilu amar, whoops, sorry about that. Ki'ilu amar, oh, sorry. Hakatu, kasher haya avi be'aram, haya Oved. When my father, right, when Yaakov was in Aram, he was like a lost person. But what does that mean? He was like a lost person. He knew where he was. He knew what he was doing. He knew what his goals were. The hatam and the reason why he was considered lost. Ani bilomamon. He was a poor person without money. We all remember he comes to Lavan's house to get married to Rachel, and he. I don't care if you men come on. No, there. So <clears throat> how could so how could he be Oved? That when he came to Aram, he had no money. And when he goes down to Mitzrayim in the end, he has no money. So it says here, right, that some, if you give a drink to someone who's lost, he's going to forget his poverty. He brings in another pasuk from later in the Tanakh, right? So when v'hatam ki lo yarashti ha'aretz mi'abi, ki ani haya, he doesn't stay. Yaakov doesn't stay in Eretz Israel. Why doesn't he stay in Eretz Israel? Because there was a famine. He has to go down to Egypt to feed his family because there's nothing left in Eretz Israel and Eretz Canaan at the time to feed his family. And that's why Yaakov goes down to Egypt. So it fits more with the Pesukim here that Yaakov goes down out of poverty, out of not being able to take the Yusha in his lifetime, and he goes down to Egypt, and that's in Egypt, and he goes down in small numbers, and he comes back to be a great nation, and Hashem takes us from Abdut, and he brings us to the great land of the land of Israel. So we're, we're, we're here, and with the Arami Oved Abe, that our, our whole purpose and our whole intention is to look back at Yaakov's life and to see how within Yaakov's lifetime itself, he sets for us an example of how we can be in the future going forward, even things when are not so difficult for us. And if we look back at Yaakov's life, we have the very familiar pasuk when Yaakov gets the blessing from Yitzchak, and Yitzchak is, is having this encounter with Yaakov, and he has this encounter with Yaakov, and he says to Yaakov, Hakol kol Yaakov v'hayadayim yidei esav. And for many, many, many generations, this has come to mean for the Jewish people that the voice of Yaakov, and not just the sound of the voice, but the, if we look in the psukim of the Tanakh there, we see how, Hash, how Yaakov spoke to Yitzchak, the words that came out of his mouth, that Yaakov was consistently referring back to Hashem, that he was consistently acknowledging Hashem in his life, acknowledging how Hashem brought him to this point, and Hakol Kol Yaakov, and that stands with us. And even when Yaakov goes down to Egypt, sorry, over here, when he goes down to Egypt, and he, all, the, all his family comes down to Egypt to live in Egypt now because of the famine that was in Eretz Israel, the Torah tells us, the Hakol Nishma Bet Paro. Now, the English translation says, the news reached Paro's palace. But there's other, way, other words that can be used to say the news reached Paro's palace. But what did Yaakov bring with him 
to Eretz Mitzrayim? What did he bring with him from Eretz Yisrael? What is the, what is the Masa that Yaakov and his sons bring with him? It's that call, the voice, the prayers, the tefillot, the acknowledgement that Hashem is always with us and that ability to see clearly through. And they come, Ache Yosef, at least in the beginning. And if you allow me, you know, there was other times of confusion in the lives of B'nai Israel and in the history of the Jewish people. And it's consistent that the voice, the voice that Yaakov had brought, the voice that Yaakov had expressed in that encounter with his father, by Yaakel, by Yaakel, comes up in other places. And another place that I found it that I thought was really profound was in the time of Shemuel Aleph, when Shaul is really chasing David, where Shaul has lost the kingdom, where Shaul has seemed to, lost, to lose his way. And there was one point where Shaul is in a cave, and when he's in that cave, when he's in that cave, David, <coughs> hold on one second, sorry. I must point out my ear. Thank you. You are, it's in your calendar, hurry up. <clears throat> Shaul, I'm sorry, I apologize everyone. When Shaul is chasing David and Shaul chases, he goes into a cave and David and his men are in this cave unbeknownst to Shaul. And David takes a piece of Shaul's cape and after Shaul and his men are telling him, kill him, kill Shaul, Hashem gave him to you in your hands at this moment, and you should use this opportunity and you should kill, you should kill him now. And David says, Chas Shalom, that I should take my hand against the Mashiach Hashem. But he goes out, David, he just doesn't, he just doesn't stop there. He doesn't pause and not kill Shaul. He goes and he uses his voice and he calls after Shaul. And he tells, and he calls to Shaul and he says, Shaul, my father, he says, today Hashem gave you into my hands, but I would never raise my hand against you. Why are you chasing me? And it's here that Shaul recognizes David's voice in the same way that, Yaakov, that Yitzhak recognized Yaakov, Yaakov's voice. And he says, Vayomer ha zebni David. And David says, Koli Adoni Melech. And it's here that the voice comes through, that the voice of recognition of Hashem, the voice of clarity in times of crisis, the voice that allows us to rise above the difficulties that consume us, that becomes the gift that B'nai Israel have for each other and from the world around us. I was looking for different firsts. So I, I found um, this story from a young woman who tells about her family and the difficulty that her family experienced. She writes that her father's side, her father's side of her family is from Spain. And as history books remind us, Spanish Jews enjoyed a golden age in harmony with other religions for many centuries until the Spanish Inquisition. This particular woman's story goes that on or around 1492, when the Jews were being forcibly expelled from Spain, my ancestors were one of the last Jewish families to leave. They resisted converting to Christianity, but did not want to leave their homeland either. It was the first night of Passover and the Seder was in full swing. They didn't care and sang loudly and openly with the windows open. People outside heard them and on that night, they were forced to leave Spain. And since it was during the Passover holiday that they were expelled, that is how we allegedly got our, our last name Pesach. Her family then moved to Greece. And again, my family faced persecution and exile. My grandparents hid in the Greek mountains with my father who was an infant. My grandfather, a rabbi, was a messenger for the Greek partisan groups who were resisting the Nazis. He was caught on more than one occasion by the Nazis, but because his intelligence, instincts, and also luck, he managed to escape. Sadly, however, much of my family was murdered in the concentration camps and did not return home. But the ones that survived persevered. They left Greece with heavy and broken hearts and moved to America, an unknown land and culture 
where they would start new and ultimately thrive. The Kabbalah states that there is a reason why things happen on the anniversary of original events. At these times, we have the ability to connect to what originally occurred and to draw strength from the events and creating change in our own lives in the present day. What I draw from my family who went through persecutions and inquisitions, Holocaust and terror, is that there is no difficulty or evil that can't be overcome. I also remember to have determination, strength and faith in God like my forebears did, even when life's events suddenly go into the direction of darkness and the unknown. So the Kabbalah states that there's a reason why things happen on the anniversary of original events. And originally when Pesach happened, Pesach happened and the Jewish people stayed home. They weren't supposed to go from home to home. They were supposed to stay in their house marked and they were not supposed to leave. And now here too, from that first Pesach to now, we are tasked with staying home staying home while the plague passed Bezrat Hashem over their houses. They stayed in for the night to give us the strength to stay in for longer. I'd like to remind everybody that, um, you know, the, all the restrictions that we have at this point to, to please stay home, to social distance if you have to go out, to wash your hands regularly. And as Rav Cook stated, may these days of Chaye Hachana allow us to achieve, to achieve Chaye Tachlit. And that's it. I want to thank the SEA for inviting me and all of you for coming. I hope that it was meaningful for everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You were great. Thank you. Thank you. Chag Sameach, everybody. Chag Sameach.